So in our previous video, we took a little bit of time reviewing different types of mutations and learning more about how mutations can occur. We talked about the adaptation theory versus mutation theory, where adaptation theory suggests that mutations occur in response to adding a selection pressure in the sense that they didn't exist until we added that pressure. The example we used were bacteria and the resistance to T1 phages. On the other hand, mutation theory, which suggests that what's happening is that the mutations existed somewhere in the population and we were just able to see the mutation. It became apparent once that pressure was added. So it could have happened at any time prior to adding whatever selection pressure, prior to adding that T1 phage in the example that we used. And I mentioned at that time that while selection pressures do not cause mutations, there are sometimes chemicals that do. One of the things that we talked about in our previous video was ethidium bromide. I mentioned compounds like EMS that will cause mutations. So the idea here is that there are some chemicals that do cause mutations. And so what we're gonna be talking about on this slide is how do we tell what types of chemicals cause mutations? Do we just unleash chemicals into the world and see if everybody becomes teenage ninjas? What do we do here? Um, and so the way that we're gonna test these chemicals to make sure that they are not gonna be mutagenic or whether they are mutagenic is through something called the Ames test, okay? So this has a couple of components. It's important not to get caught up in sort of the mundane aspects of this, thinking that they're the important part of it. Um, so we're gonna go through each of these kind of one by one. So in this setup, what we're gonna see is that we extract liver enzymes from rats. So master splinter here, giving up some of its liver enzymes. This is important, particularly when we're looking at maybe even something like medications or something that we intend for a human body to interact with in some way. Remember that our liver is gonna break things down and each one of those intermediates along this pathway of breaking down a compound could have its own inherent mutagenic properties. So to kind of test all of these, we add liver enzymes from rats at this time. Okay, so we've got our S9 extract. That's again, enzymes that are gonna allow us to see every possible step of breakdown and whether that's gonna induce a mutation. Okay, we're also gonna have specialized bacteria. These are His minus. And what this means is that they cannot make the amino acid histidine. So these are kind of like those oxytrophic mutants that we just studied in the last chapter. Okay, it's important here not to get caught up in the his minus aspect of this bacteria, like it's the discovery. Previously, we really focused on which amino acid can this not make? This is a different thing. So, the important part of this isn't that this is specifically his minus, it's the fact that it will give us something to observe. So in a normal situation, our his minus strain when grown on media without histidine, these won't be able to grow because they have no histidine, they cannot make histidine, there is no histidine, so they should not grow. Again, this is not the discovery. This gives us an opportunity to view mutations when they happen. So it just creates a situation. So once we add our compound, this is our test chemical. We've mixed together our liver enzyme, our S9 extract and our bacteria, we've plated it. We add a little bit of the chemical on a little filter disc, a little filter paper right in the middle so that it can kind of absorb around into the media. The idea here is that if this is mutagenic, we're going to see a reversion 
of this his minus mutation. So if all of a sudden these bacteria are able to produce their own histidine again, there's been a mutation. So all, we're, all we care about is, did this cause mutations? So positive result would be growth of bacterial colonies beyond the level of the control because again, what has happened is this chemical caused a second mutation which kind of reversed the phenotype of not being able to make histidine. So again, the fact that it can't make histidine is not the end all be all. The fact that we're really looking for is whether we can have a second mutation that bypassed that. We don't care what it is. So it's important to note here, we're not testing these mutants. We're testing this chemical to see if it causes mutants to arise. So if we have a lot of colonies appear, then this chemical is likely causing mutations. By contrast, a negative result, we might see a few colonies. This would be you know, comparable to whatever control. Note, again, there are a few colonies here. When you're dealing with bacteria, this is very much a Jurassic Park life finds a way situation. You will get a couple of colonies, but again, we're assuming there's a control somewhere that had like water or something on it that we're testing as well. If this is comparable to the control, we get a negative result. If we see many colonies, a significant amount above the control, this is causing mutations, which kind of revert that second mutation. So a positive result is bacterial growth. Again, the important thing here is how many mutants arise, not what they are, not that they can make histidine, and we need that just that the mutations occur. So seeing something like this would cause you to go back and look at this chemical and say it causes mutations. So whatever it is, if it's something you were hoping to include as part of pharmacological or something, I would not, okay? But um, again, comparing this to the control, that's how we read an AIMS test and that's what it's for. So the second test that we're gonna talk about or really process we're gonna talk about for working with mutants is something we'll just go over today, but the idea will come up perhaps a little bit later throughout the semester. And this is the idea of working with bacteria and, uh, and being able to identify oxytrophic mutants. So this is separate from the AIMS test, so don't, don't necessarily try to uh, make a lot of connections that don't exist between replica plating and the AIMS test. The purpose of replica plating is to make it easier to study oxytrophic mutants. So when we looked at the beetle and tatum experiment with the neurospora, we were growing a single spore in each tube. That means that everything in that tube was identical. When we're working with bacteria, it's a little bit difficult to do that. You can do it, um, but the way that we work with bacteria, that's not always how we end up starting. So we often end up by growing bacteria on what we call a master plate. So this might be complete media, okay? The idea being that each one of these colonies arose from a single cell, a separate single cell for each one, which means that within each colony, within each of these dots, are millions of cells that are identical within that colony. This colony genetically might be distinct from this colony next to it. Each one of these is like millions of clones of the same thing, but distinct from each other. So the idea is if you've mutagenized these and are looking for mute oxytrophic mutants, any one of these could be a mutant, okay? But growing these on complete media, you won't know. However, if we started these on minimal media and they can't make everything that they need, the mutants simply won't grow in the first place. So how do you balance being able to grow the mutant with being able to identify? A mutant. And that's where replica plating comes into play here. So 
that's going to allow us to have duplicate plates, one on complete media, one on minimal media, so that we understand what's happening. So here, the way this works, and this is this is just a fancy arts and crafts moment right here. We're just going to use a velveteen surface, kind of like a velvet stamp. We press it down on the master plate and stamp it onto our next plate, which will have minimal medium. So this is the replica plate. Our original plate had complete medium. A replica plate has minimal. For oxytrophic mutants, what we would be looking for would be mutants that were missing on the replica plate, which were present on the complete medium. This would suggest that they can grow if you give it everything it needs, but it's missing some element of its biochemical pathways to make everything it needs on its own. And so we can go back to this original plate and mess around with this guy here. We've identified it, we can grow it up in its own tube now. So we've kind of balanced those two aspects of growing it and being able to identify it. So this is something that the idea of this will come back a little bit later on. For now, it's just kind of keeping in mind how we study mutants. So again, this is a separate technique from the AIMS test. The point of this is to be able to identify and grow mutants particularly oxytrophic mutants. The AIMS test was specifically to identify chemicals which would cause mutations. So these are just a couple of ways that we can study and work with mutants. So as promised, the last five, six slides of this video will deal with understanding a bit more about transposons. So we've included transposons here for a number of reasons. Some of them I'll just kind of talk to you about um, in terms of why this might be included with mutations. Um, we'll also have at the end just a little bit of an idea of how we can use transposons to our advantage. So of course these were discovered in 1950 by Barbara McClintock and this was really an amazing discovery if you think about it. So here's the deal. Again, we're looking at corn where each one of these kernels is its own offspring and we're looking at segregation ratios. And we have not gotten to the review of Punnett Square, Mendelian genetics in this class yet. However, hopefully the three to one ratio, dominant receptive, those types of things kind of ring a bell. So we're dealing with Mendelian ratios. And one of the things that Barbara McClintock observed is that these purple yellow kernels, they're not following any kind of real Mendelian pattern. Like you might look at it and say, okay, maybe this is like a, maybe this is a three to one, but then you get to counting multiple samples, multiple specimens. You see that something's kind of off about that. It's not even a case of incomplete dominance. Like what in the heck? Okay, so this is one of the ways that she started to really note that something suspicious was going on here. Um, to also use some chromosomal visualization techniques a little bit later to kind of confirm some of these mobile elements. But really like, imagine being so observant that you count these, you notice it, and you're like, you're not just like, hey, maybe I'm having a bad day with the data. You're like, something's deviating from Mendelian ratios here. So this is kind of the origins of when she discovered these transposable elements. So. A little bit later, we'll talk about the structure of transposable elements in general, some features that they might include. But let's continue on with this example in maize so that you can follow along with Barbara McClintock's discovery. So this was, of course, a transposable element that's going to affect the pigment gene. So we're looking at a pigment gene. And while most of the corn that we study now is actually going to be you know, or that we like to eat. A lot of the corn we see in stores, we think of as yellow and yellow might feel to you like it's the natural normal color for corn. In a lot of varieties, the normal color is actually purple for some of these kernels. So in this case, a purple kernel indicates that there's a normal pigment gene, which we'll call C, that's expressing a purple pigment that makes these kernels purple. So this is right here where you should be thinking. C gene makes pigment, makes purple, okay? 
now we can add in this transposable element. So elsewhere in the genome, we've got a couple of things going on. We have the DS element. This is the actual mobile element. So our transposons are gonna move around in the genome. This is gonna be the piece that moves. It's named DS for dissociation, okay? AC will be the activator, okay? So we'll see how that works in a minute. Right now, these are not doing anything. They're just present in the genome. They're not bothering anything. C makes color purple, you get purple kernels. So this is kind of the native state. When this DS element gets ready to go, what happens is our activator element stays where it is, but it activates the movement of DS. And so DS can pick up and move, you can see it's vacated this original location and move into the middle of this gene for pigment, okay? And we just finished talking about the ramifications of in, like, even single nucleotide insertions and frame shift mutations. This is a transposable element. It could be thousands of nucleotides long. Some of them are thousands of nucleotides long. Some of them are maybe a little bit less than that. But this is a lot of nucleotides just to shove into the middle of a coding region. The end result of that is we no longer can make any purple pigment. So these kernels are yellow. So this yellow state in this particular type of corn is, is the mutated sort of state we've disrupted this normal gene's function, so we cannot make pigment, okay? So that accounts for purple and that accounts for yellow. What about these spotted guys, okay? And these are interesting too. So again, the thing that we need to think about here is, and we'll see this more on the next slide, is sort of again remembering that DS is mobile. So yeah, it jumped in, but it can jump out at any time, in and out at any point that it wants to. So if it jumps back out, resume creation of pigment. So how do that create spots? In order to understand the spotted pattern, we have to think about, again, each of these kernels being a single beautiful union of egg and sperm for these corn. So each one starts out single cell, ready to divide, okay? And so we can say maybe we have some instances where the DS element jumps in or out of the C gene at different times. So let's imagine that each one of these are three different examples where we have kernels that are going to exhibit different patterns of this DS movement. So let's say that these cells divide. Okay, so for this first example, the DS element is still mining its own business. It's not in the pigment gene. The pigment's still created. We divide. Fine. We divide again. Fine. We divide again. Still no activity from DS. This will if you zoom out, imagine these are cells. If you imagine a lot more of them and then zoom out all the cells that create this purple kernel, that's what we're looking at. Our second example, the DS element has jumped in at the very beginning into this pigment gene. So we're making yellow kernels, no pigment that's purple. We continue to divide, the DS element stays in this pigment gene the entire time, a completely yellow kernel if it never moves again. Now let's take the spotted example. And again, these are single cells. They might divide. In this case, we're still making pigment. Oh, but here, between these cell divisions, the DS element has jumped into the pigment gene for these particular cells. Okay, so it's jumped in, and that means anything that divides from it might still be yellow, while anything dividing over here might be purple. And again, as we expand this out, I didn't make any more cells, but as we expand this out, you can imagine that at another point, perhaps, we're going to have the DS element jump out, or maybe over here we have some jump in. And this is during the development of that kernel. So it's not happening that we care about after it's developed, 
But during development, as we still have cell division, we can have patches where cells arise from cells where the pigment gene is distorted and cells where we can still create pigment. And that's going to give us spots when you zoom out. Okay, so you can kind of think cell lineages, everything in the purple originated from cells that can still make pigment. Everything that's yellow originated from cells that could no longer make pigment. So this is how we get different patterns. Okay, and you can kind of see why this would be a deviation from Mendelian ratios. So last couple of slides, I just want to talk about sort of a general structure of transposable elements. I'm only gonna use one example and there are thousands of different types of mobile elements, just a lot of different types of mobile elements, but just so we get an idea. And then we'll talk about how we can use these to our advantage, one of the ways we can harness them. So the example that I wanna show is transposable element in yeast. And this is going to actually show us some of the features that we wanna see. So here, again, we have the coding region for that transposon. This can sometimes encode proteins that help this move, sometimes just random. And you can see this is almost 6,000 nucleotides long. So this is a fairly long one, okay? And what happens in here can be highly variable depending on what type of element we're looking at. Some of the features on the ends, transposable elements always have some kind of feature on the ends, usually kind of a repeat or inverted repeat region that are going to make it so that uh, we sort of recognize this as a left and right insertion sequence. And this is gonna help this transposable element decide where it's gonna integrate. And sometimes these elements can pick up and move like we saw with DS and they're just vacating the spot they were in. Sometimes they can make copies of themselves and proliferate. And again, this is in yeast. This is one type of a yeast transposable element. There are so many of these. So some features to just kind of keep in mind is that usually there are left and right flanking sequences which kind of dictate where this might go in the genome and then variable things in this sort of central region. This one has two proteins, we can make RNA from it. Other things can be any kind of anything, basically in here, sometimes it's just kind of a mess, okay, that proliferates. But um, keeping in mind, you can imagine something like large like this, it'd be pretty easy to disrupt a gene if you dropped all of this right into the middle of its coding region. So, that's one of the things that we can take from this. Okay, finally, we can learn a little bit more about Drosophila, okay, and how we can use these to our advantage. So let's just pay attention to the top here, okay? What we're dealing with is gonna be bacteria, I'm sorry, Drosophila, that are going to have mutation that makes their eyes a nice rosy color instead of the wild type Red. So this is the wild type version down here. This is going to be the rosy color here. Okay, this is our rosy gene. Um, in this case, the plus indicates that it's wild type. So this is the, even though it's pink, this is going to be the copy of the gene that encodes a red eye. Okay, the genes for a red eye. So we can take an embryo from a mutant, pink eyed, rosy mutant. Okay. Take that embryo, and what we can do is notice the structure of this. This is the coding region for our eye pigment. These are those left and right flanking sequences. So this is a transposable element, which we're calling a P element, which transposable elements are designed to jump around in the genome and to insert themselves. So our goal is to try and insert a wild type copy of this into a rosy mutant. So we collect our embryo from this, which will in principle have a rosy eye gene in its genome. We draw our wild type copy that's embedded in this transposable element structure down into our embryo, hoping that the machinery that is gonna insert this element just goes ahead and does it so we don't have to worry about it. 
drop it down into the genome so it's more or less stably embedded into the actual chromosome of these Drosophila. Find out the descendants have a normal eye color. So using the system, people do try to harness things like gene editing. This is not a super reliable way to edit genes, mostly because you don't have a ton of control over where it goes. Like you can control what gene goes here, but you can't control whether this will insert in a good place or a bad place in the genome. You can't really control whether it's gonna drop into an important gene, whether it's gonna cause more issues. So this is nice for Drosophila, uh, but I think this is something we don't have a lot of control over in general. But one thing that we can use transposable elements for is to, is to actually mutagenize populations. So if we want to create mutants like we did with x-rays, we can actually use transposable elements and try to get them to drop down into a set of genes um, so that we can study whatever it is. So that's one way we can use it. And you'll see these as T, probably like a tDNA insertion which will be something if you're reading papers about it. So learning about these, if you have a lot of questions, you feel like this didn't really answer them, that's okay. Transposons are, are kind of weird. There's still a lot of mystery surrounding them. One of the biggest questions is really just, how does it know when to jump? What is gonna trigger it? And some of these things we know a little bit about it and some of them we don't know at all. So we'll be talking a little bit more about transposons as we go through the semester, but for now, we're just gonna end with understanding a little bit more about their structure, how they were discovered, and some of the uses that they have in modern biology.